Marcus is someone who's been in and out of the eMERGE room uh, for the last many years with his heart failure. You've been the eMERGE doc on maybe about half the times when he's come in and you developed a, a pretty good relationship with Marcus. When you see him on your next shift in the eMERGE, you see he's kind of been in and out, in and out, prolonged stays, not really getting better, not a candidate for any invasive or, or aggressive therapies and he's just being medically managed. And you start a brief conversation around focusing on comfort at this stage in his disease and he really likes that approach. He knows you better than most of his other docs because he's been in and out so often. And uh, so Marcus kind of likes that. He gets admitted, meets the palliative team, all those good things happen. He goes home and he's getting home palliative care. And then on February 7th, 2016, so when this law becomes enacted, and I'll get into the dates, but the next time you're on, uh, in February, he comes in and he says, look, I've been at home now for four months. Palliative care is coming. They're doing a great job. They're, they're, they're all very good, but my, it's just getting to the point that I can't handle this anymore. And I need to go peacefully, and I'm ready. I've said my goodbyes. I've spoken to everyone I need to speak to. Um, my palliative doctor is not really interested in having this conversation because I've tried before. Can you help me? So can you, the doc who I've known for the last 10 years on and off in my eMERGE visits, can you help me end my life now or in the very near future because this is what I want? And so you're kind of put on that spot. So think about Marcus or someone similar. I'm sure you've all had someone, something like that in your careers, but that's something that could very reasonably happen in the near future. And then Nancy, Nancy's, uh, when you were a medical trainee, Nancy was a nurse in the eMERGE and she was one of those nice nurses uh, who was helpful and, and kind of, because uh, there are the other type, I guess. Um, I know we have some nurses in the audience, so we have bad docs too, it's okay. Um, so she's one of the nurses who really kind of got you interested in eMERGE, helped you along, gave you tips when you, when you needed them. And when she retired about five or six years ago, she stayed involved with the eMERGE. So she volunteers, she comes regularly, and one of the problems that Nancy has here in London is she doesn't have a regular family doc. So whenever something, she's a pretty healthy lady, so whenever something minor comes up, she often asks you as someone who's known her for a long time for some advice and you've occasionally written in her scripts or, or had testing done as appropriate. So you're kind of playing a bit of a role of her, her care, primary care provider just because she has nobody else. Um, and then Nancy comes to you uh, just a couple days ago and she tells you that she's recently been told she actually was feeling very unwell on a trip over to Toronto, ended up having to go to eMERGE, had a scan of her brain and found out she had a brain tumor. Uh, they had a conversation, she had a brief admission to hospital there, they told her that you know there's not really anything medical treatment wise that they could do, if they do it would be very aggressive, very toxic and she's not at all interested. She comes back home to London and she tells you she still doesn't have a, a primary care provider and she tells you that look, <laughs> I've known you for a long time. You know me as an independent, strong person, and I want to stay that way for my entire life. And when I'm ready and when I feel like I'm losing some of my abilities, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to ask you if you can help me in this process. She's basically asking you for some assistance in helping her pass away at a time of her choosing uh, now that she has this diagnosis. So you're kind of, this is, this is something that you're thinking about and, and you're trying to figure out what your role is in this picture. So keep those couple of cases in mind. Those are, I think, relatively realistic scenarios. And I'm sure you have some other realistic scenarios that you've encountered in your own practice uh, and as we move forward. And we'll come back to them at the end for some discussion. So just to start off, I'm going to clarify a few of the terms. So there's um, often a bit of um, misunderstanding or confusion around a few of the, the words I've thrown out here. So medical aid in dying, so these are all CMA-based definitions. CMA came out about a year ago and kind of said, look, there's a lot of confusion in the words, so let's just lay something down and try to stick to the same, same language here. So medical aid in dying is basically the physician playing a role in participating in the death. So that could be directly giving drugs, or it could be writing a prescription for drugs, it could be telling people how to take certain drugs or, or other means. So you could be directly involved or indirectly involved, okay? And, and I'll just mention here, this is basically what the Supreme Court has said. Even though they've used slightly different terms, they've said they've opened it up for either option. And, they, uh, and I'll clarify that in a, in a few minutes. Euthanasia is, is a little bit different. So euthanasia is a physician that could be voluntary, where you have consent of the patient. It could be involuntary, where you don't have the consent. Um, but it's basically an active role that the physician plays in 
assisting the death. So there you're actually giving the drug, pressing the button, doing whatever actively yourself. And obviously, you know, to separate it out from just plain murder, there's uh, a few key things. So, you know, you'd say, well, if you're actively doing something, you can do it to anybody. So there's a few key caveats. So they, they have to have an incurable illness. You have to, as a physician, know about that. You have to be doing it with good intention and with empathy and compassion, not for life insurance money or whatever else. Um, so that's uh, euthanasia. So you, maybe you can see a bit of a difference there. Physician-assisted death, so technically, and there's a bit of confusion because of the Supreme Court kind of used the words physician-assisted death in their rulings, uh, but they also, if you read the fine print and the full kind of 100-something page uh, ruling, uh, what they really mean is medical aid in dying. So physician-assisted death, according to the CMA, means the physician providing the means for someone to end their own life. So you write the script, you give it to the patient, they go fill the script, take the drugs, or, or whatever the process is, but you are not the one physically pouring the medication in their mouth or injecting the medication into their body. Um, uh, physician-assisted suicide is basically, you know, physician-assisted death is from the physician's perspective, the suicide part is from the patient's perspective where um, they're the ones taking the medications themselves with the assistance of a physician who writes a script. Um, and just to clarify that a little bit more, so medical aid in dying is a broader term. That's what the Supreme Court is talking about. And, and you can, even though you've heard the word physician assisted death in the media and in other places, and, and I think I even put it out initially as a topic, as a title for this talk, what we're really talking about is both options when it comes to Canadian Supreme Court ruling. So palliative sedation, you've heard this. So palliative sedation is currently in practice in London and most places in Canada. And it basically just means using sedating medications in a palliative setting. The intent is not to hasten death. The intent is to alleviate suffering. Um, and so sometimes these words end up in the same sentences and it's just important in your minds to separate them out. Um, one point I'll just make on palliative sedation. So we'll talk very briefly later on about uh, for example, the Catholic Healthcare Alliance is, is strongly against medical aid in dying, and they've said that explicitly many times. St. Joe's is a Catholic Healthcare Alliance uh, institution. Uh, in St. Joe's, they do palliative sedation. Uh, so, for example, at Parkwood, it's part of their practice. But uh, so, so they've differentiated that ethically and morally from uh, medical aid in dying. Dying with dignity is another word that you'll see thrown out in the media. So all that really means is following a patient's wishes about end of life. It means nothing to do with how it's done or what's done. There's a group out there called Dying with Dignity, which is a big advocate for medical aid in dying. Um, so that's, that's where some of the terms get a bit confusing at times. Sue Rodriguez, uh, in the early 90s, filed um, a challenge against the current uh, criminal code which said that assisted suicide is Ill illegal. Sue Rodriguez had ALS and she knew that down the road she would become more and more debilitated and she wanted to end her life at a time of her choosing. So she said, you know, this law against assisted suicide is not fair to me because I know when I'm ready to die and maybe that's when she can no longer eat, for example. I won't have the physical capacity to end my own life. So I want someone else to end it for me. So that was uh, in the early 90s. And the Supreme Court said at that time that yes, Sue and, and other people in her positions write to what we call security of person, or you can think of it kind of like autonomy, her ability to um, do what she wills with her body is being compromised with this law. But we're worried that if we made assisted suicide legal, it could be abused, so maybe it's used in context that we didn't intend. And there's this concept of life in, it, in and of itself being um, good. So this concept called sanctity of life, a lot of religious beliefs prescribe to that. Um, and they said, you know, those two things, the potential for abuse and the sanctity of life kind of override Sue's security of person argument. So uh, they basically said at that point, five to four decisions, so a close decision, they said, no, you know what, it's 1993, we're still going to keep assisted suicide illegal. The minority group said, well, suicide's not illegal, so making assisted suicide illegal is limiting disabled people. And that's one of many arguments that, that were against this at that time. Jack Kevorkian, uh, also known as Dr. Death, he was in, uh, practicing in the U.S., in states where assisted death was not legal, and I'll get into in a few minutes some of the places where it is legal in different places in the world. But he was practicing, I believe, in Michigan, uh, where it was not legal and still isn't. 
And he openly admitted that, you know, I help people die when they're ready to, to die. Um, he went, uh, was challenged in court four times, never convicted. Uh, and uh, despite the fact that it was clear and he openly admitted to doing this, he never was convicted for it until 1998. So there's, uh, he went on 60 Minutes, broadcast nationwide in the States and other places in the world. And it was all about kind of what he does and why he thinks physician-assisted death is, is appropriate or euthanasia, uh, which is what he was practicing as well, is appropriate. Um, and there's a video, and you can catch it. There's a short New York Times YouTube clip if you're interested. And it's like 10 minutes long uh, where it goes through him, his life a little bit. Um, he openly on uh, national TV uh, has a patient with, I believe, ALS in front of him who said, he asks, you know, do you want to end your life? And he says yes in front of the camera. And obviously they've had a background conversation before all of this. And he actively injects some medication and the patient dies on camera. So very kind of dramatic on national TV. And uh, the judge kind of said, you know, this is pushing it way too far. You've openly committed a crime on TV. Um, witness nationwide and sent him to jail for about nine years. Uh, he was released in 2007 and stays in, uh, a strong advocate for physician-assisted death. And uh, although I don't, he was a pathologist, I believe, by training. He doesn't practice any clinical medicine, and he's barred. He was also a general practitioner because back then you could do both. Um, I heard the laughs at pathology, but that's okay. Um, but uh, but he was barred from clinical practice. But he does still advocate for this. Okay, so this was, now we're into the kind of late 90s, setting the North American stage a little bit of what's going on. There's different places in the world which have different policies. Uh, these are all the places where some form of physician-assisted death is uh, not illegal. So I'm not saying legal because some places, they purposely just don't have laws so that you're not prosecuted, but they have not formally made it legal. Um, and I'll talk about just a couple of them, actually a few of them in, in a little bit of detail. So. Switzerland is uh, a place where it's not illegal to commit uh, physician-assisted death or euthanasia. It's the only place of that list and of anywhere in the world at present where you do not have to be a resident of that place to go and get physician-assisted death. So you could be a Canadian who has whatever disease and you can, so for example, in the current Supreme Court uh, case there that was just passed, there was someone named Kay Carter who had severe spinal stenosis. She went down to Switzerland had physician-assisted death several years ago. Okay, so um, there's, and they're the only country and only jurisdiction where there's no residency requirements. Belgium has uh, kind of made the news lately for, for slightly different reasons. So uh, one, there, this is an article from a couple of years ago um, in a Canadian paper. They are very, uh, probably among all the regions listed there, one of the most uh, open or liberal, you might say, about their policies. So for example, in their laws, minors are allowed to request physician-assisted death, so children of any age, although until this time, it's been about 13 years, there have been no children who've requested or at least been approved of it. Um, you can have psychological illness, and many places do that, purely psychological illness, and you can request it. Um, and then I bring it up because there was something that some of you may have caught. This is just from last month in the, Toronto, in the National Post. Um, but... <coughs> Uh, this past summer, uh, the, this documentary group created a documentary in Belgium, filming the physician on the right there, uh, and yeah, on your right, who uh, is a big advocate for physician-assisted death. And he, uh, on camera, kind of showed a few of the cases he's dealing with, and obviously with everyone's permission and consent. And he showed one specific example of an 85-year-old lady who he had known for many years. She lives in, in I believe, a long-term care home. Her daughter passes away, and I'm, I'm abbreviating the story, but I can give you the link if you're interested. It's an hour-long documentary. Her daughter passes away, and then he sees her. He's, a, I believe, a general practitioner, treats her for depression. Um, she doesn't feel better. She still wants to end her life. And three months after her daughter passing away, he uh, helps her end her life. So the, it made kind of national news because this was the first case in Belgium after 13 years of doing physician-assisted death where the committee which regulates it said, you know, maybe this wasn't appropriate and they're going the next step to legal action. Um, so we don't know where it will end up, whether he will or will not be convicted, but it's the first time things are actually going to court. In Belgium, the way it works, and 
Uh, I'm giving you some of these examples because we haven't figured it out in Canada yet. And we might end up somewhere in the middle of, of what some of these different jurisdictions are doing. So in Belgium, if you request physician-assisted death, your physician has certain protocols they have to follow, you know, re re regulations, and I'll go through them for, for a couple other places in a moment. And then they file a report. They go ahead and do the procedure based on their own judgment, and usually they need a second and I believe a third physician in Belgium to also approve it before they go ahead with the procedure. And the committee that reviews this reviews it after the fact. So once a person's already passed away because there's a time lag and some of these things are urgent or people are in very intense suffering, they review it and the reviews obviously can't help that individual but might help the process later on. A Couple of the challenges, the review committee has a lot of the physicians who are actively involved. So for example, both of the physicians here who are strong advocates for physician assisted death sit on that committee. Um, so there's a lot of uh, tension about what's going on. There's a lot of other uh, interesting things about Belgium you can, you can get from that documentary. If you're interested, I can give you a link later. So states are neighbors down south. So there's three states where it's legal and two where it's not illegal. So the latter two there. Um, and they, they have a few regulations. So they say you have to be an adult, you have to be competent, you have to be a resident there, and it has to be voluntary and you must be terminally ill. So that terminally ill statement is gone from our Canadian legislation, just so you know, and I'll, I'll show that in a few slides. Um, and then they have a bunch of requirements from the physician. Oral written requests with witnesses, waiting periods, second opinions, and uh, another waiting period after the second request. There's a, there's a group, uh, this Royal Society of Canada, um, which came out and it, it was comprised of a variety of people, including uh, physicians, family physicians, public health physicians, ethicists. I think it was a group of about 10 or 12 um, experts in the area or who, who were deemed to be experts to, uh, were commissioned to come out with a report and in 2011 so a few years ago they said that the law should be changed and assisted suicide and euthanasia so we've already said that's medical aid in dying should be legalized because there's no difference between the two if we're going to legalize one we should legalize both this is four years ago and they said you know they have to be competent or have an advanced directive uh, they don't, you don't need to have some special competency skills, so you can't say, you know what, I'm, uh, I'm focused in the eMERGE, I don't know how to assess for capacity with regards to physician-assisted death. No, if you're assessing capacity for medications or other things, you should be able to assess for this as well, according to this group. Um, the, it obviously has to be voluntary informed. And they, they said, you know, unlike the American jurisdic jurisdictions, they said, don't say terminal illness. They said that unfairly um, targets a group that may not have a terminal illness per se, but has intolerable suffering uh, or is um, in some pain that cannot be alleviated. So they, they specifically say not to. And I bring this up because some of this seems to have informed what the Supreme Court uh, ruled. They said you, it can be verbal and we need an oversight commission. And they said we must be able to refer. So the question I asked yes or no earlier uh, included referring, right? So being involved includes referring. So Quebec, so coming a bit closer to home, Quebec's the only province, the only real Canadian jurisdiction that's been a bit proactive uh, with this um, since actually predating the Supreme Court ruling back in February. And they had a bill called Bill 52, which had three key components and, I'll, uh, and it came out about a year and a half ago. They said mandatory palliative care services everywhere in Quebec, uh, a protocol for palliative sedation and some guidelines on medical aid in dying. So they said we need those three things. Two thirds of the Quebec physicians two years ago said we think medical aid in dying is an appropriate part of our uh, care as physicians. Um, so that contrasts and I'll show from what many other Canadian physicians have said. But Quebec two thirds in favour. And in June of 2014, like I said about a year and a half ago, the, the Quebec Assembly said okay we're going to pass this three pronged bill and let's go into the detail because it's our only Canadian example of where something is actually being implemented. So a few things. So they said you have to be a full age. They don't define what that is. So is that 17, 18, 16? Um, is it different for people with uh, different mental capacities? But you have to be a full age. You have to be capable. So this is not me deciding for uh, my loved one who's no longer capable. I as an individual have to be capable at the time. In Quebec they say it has to be end of life. I've already said the, the court ruling doesn't say anything about terminal illness, but Quebec says, no, we want to restrict this to end of life. However, that's defined and they don't define it in the bill. 
Um, it has to be serious and incurable, and it has to be irreversible. So this is not something that you can treat and get better. So a depression that maybe hasn't been tried at treatment yet, um, it would have to be potentially a refractory depression to every therapy out there because they also say it can be physical or psychological. So purely psychological suffering is uh, okay. It doesn't have to be that you have advanced heart failure and um, we know we can transplant your heart. It could be that you have such severe mental illness, you've tried treatments, you've seen the right docs and it's not uh, treatable. And the patient themselves has to say it's intolerable. Not the physician, not their wife, not their whoever. It has to be the patient's decision that, you know what, you might think I'm not in that much pain, but I really, really am. And it's really that bad. So that's, that's uh, the way their bill kind of sits. And this is, um, actually the date will come up in a sec. But uh, I just mentioned there that it's got to be voluntary and you have to be living in Quebec. So what does a physician, physician have to do? So lots of things. So this is where, uh, you know, if you're thinking of your practical role, if, you, if this is going to be part of your practice, there's a bunch of uh, regulations and things that you have to do as a physician. So there's some, some paperwork that needs to be done. You have to confirm they're eligible based on everything on that last slide. You have to tell them about other treatment options. So yes, I know you want, you're asking for a physician, you know, my assistance in dying, but did you know um, we have a home palliative care service that maybe you haven't tapped into? Did you know that we have this new drug that might help with some of your symptoms? Did you know we could up your narcotics a little bit more? So you have to tell them options. So there have to be reasonable intervals. So you remember Marcus at the beginning, he's been, uh, he said this maybe to you the first time, but he's expressed some interest maybe in the past. It can't be a one time of having a horrible day, the pain's terrible today, and I want you to help me. It's got to be multiple periods of time. You need a second doctor, and you have to be with them until they pass away. And the, the thought here is that if you're going to be prescribing a large quantity of lethal drugs, and then you walk away and tell them to go home and take it, if they don't take it, what happens to those drugs? Will those drugs go somewhere else um, if you don't stay with them till death? And if they have side effects or they're not tolerating it, you as a physician maybe can help them through the process. In about three weeks, this is going to go into effect in Quebec. So it will be, even though the federal legislation is, is delayed till February, in Quebec, it will be legal and physicians al there already have guidelines on how to, what the protocols are for physician aid in dying or medical aid in dying. Um, and then the physicians have a few obligations. So you don't have to do it, but you have to refer. So you have to get them to somebody who's willing to, to do this. And that's kind of a common theme across most jurisdictions. Uh, you have to put in a report to a commission. And if your institution says, we do not permit medical aid in dying, then you're not obligated to do it. So for example, if, you live, if you're working exclusively in a Catholic healthcare um, institution that has said explicitly, we will not be participating in this, then you're not obligated to. So that's Quebec. Donald Lowe, he was kind of the ID doc in Toronto who has uh, got a lot of media attention during SARS. He was their main uh, go-to person during SARS and kind of the face of, uh, of um, the ID system in Toronto during that difficult time. Um, just a couple years ago, he was diagnosed with a brain tumor. This is all public knowledge. So he was diagnosed with a brain tumor and he made an online plea, uh, which you can see on YouTube if you want. It was aired on CBC, has lots of hits on YouTube, where he said, we really need something on physician aid in dying. We need a policy. I am not happy the way I'm, I don't think he specifically said I'm not happy, but he basically said, we need a policy. And I believe indirectly kind of saying that he, with his brain tumor is coming to the point that um, he was having difficulty. About a week after the video, uh, was shot and perhaps before it aired, I'm not sure of the exact timeline, he passed away and the details are a bit unclear but per, it, it's thought because of a complication of his disease, not necessarily that he had uh, aid in dying but this got a lot of attention for a lot of people because he was a physician, um, he was a very well-known media figure since SARS and he made this kind of very public plea in 2013, two years ago before the, the law came about. So what, do, what does our uh, CMA kind of say about things? So in July of 2014, so we're kind of trying to follow things through in a, in a timeline a bit, um, there was a national dialogue. They had a bunch of meetings, a bunch of online discussion forums. Maybe some people in the audience even participated in some of that. And they asked a question in July, so about a year and a half ago. They said at that point the policy was physicians are not involved in medical aid and dying or physician-assisted death. We're not involved. And they asked 
physicians, only a couple hundred responded, but how many, how many of you are in favor with our current policy, which is against medical aid in dying? Um, which piece of the pie do you think covers those in favor of the current policy, meaning we do not want physician aid in dying? So any training, which piece? Big piece, small piece? Small, small, small. I hear a lot of small. So it's actually the big piece. So three quarters of the physicians who responded, and you can say, you know, maybe there's some bias in who responded to this sort of poll, but three quarters said, leave things alone. We're okay with the way the policy is. We don't really want to be involved in this. More or less is what I'm taking out of that question. In December, based on um, all of their discussions with uh, different physician groups, uh, some of what was happening in the media, uh, the CMA alter their policy and they said, you know what, maybe medical aid in dying is appropriate, may be appropriate. And they said, physicians should still be able to follow their conscience. They should not be compelled to participate, but there should be no undue delay. So just because I don't want to be a part of this doesn't mean I'm going to have my patient wait three months to see somebody who might consider it. So that, that was the CMA's new policy about uh, in December. And then a poll, uh, this was in 2015, so a few months after that, 30%, 29% of uh, the physicians would consider providing it, and 19% would be if it was only psychological. Now you can ask, well, why is it 30%? Is it maybe because there's no guidelines? Is it because we don't really have protocols, we haven't been trained, or is it because we're morally opposed? Um, and it's probably a mix of all of that. So now to the, the current case, um, February 6, 2015. So, uh, I'm assuming, I won't ask, but I'm assuming everyone's heard something about this case, but I'm just going to try to clarify some of the details and this is an opportunity to discuss that, um, just to follow it through a little bit. So 2011, the initial challenge went forward. So this group in BC, so the BC Civil Liberties Association, uh, a family physician, uh, Gloria Taylor, who I believe had ALS, and Kay Carter, who I mentioned before, had spinal stenosis and is the one who went to Switzerland soon after. They said, Assisted death is not, uh, th this law is not right. We're going to take it to the BC Supreme Court. And the BC C Supreme Court said, yeah, you're right. This law is violating uh, the gravely ill. Parliament has to rewrite it. Gloria Taylor, you have temporary permis permission for medical aid in dying. She passed away on her own later in the year without medical aid in dying. But they gave her permission for about a year. And they said, um, the BC Supreme Court, so the provincial Supreme Court said, um, it is legal. We think it should be legal. The federal government said, which at that time was a conservative government, um, overturned that and said, you know what, uh, we do not think what the BC Supreme Court is saying is appropriate, so we're going to challenge this. And the appeal court said, you know what, a provincial court can't override what a national court has said. So the Supreme Court back in 93 with Sue Rodriguez, they're the ones who said physician-assisted death is illegal. So they said, no, you as a provincial court can't overturn that, so it's still illegal. So then, you know, this group, the BC Civil Liberties Association and the others uh, went to the Supreme Court of Canada and that's in October 2014, they had their case heard for why it should be made legal again. So a little bit convoluted, but um, some of you may have heard different things in the past, so just trying to straighten that out. Supreme Court in February of this past year said medical aid in dying is legal, uh, but we're going to give you a 12 month window, so it's not illegal yet. It's not legal yet, sorry, but we're going to give the provinces, the territories, uh, the, the lawmakers 12 months to figure out how exactly to enact this. But in 12 months time, meaning on February 6, 2016, which is just a few months away, this will no longer be illegal. Okay. Um, and then they put in a few uh, specific uh, restrictions. So they said it must be a competent adult. So this is not your... Uh, older demented patient whose wife says you know what he wouldn't want to live this way can you please give him something no this is the adult themselves saying I do not want to live this way um, so it has to be a competent adult making the decision they have to clearly consent right so no obvious evidence of con uh, coercion or anything like that it has to be an irremediable condition not terminal so they don't use terminal so it has to be something that is grievous and irremediable so it, can't, it does not have to be that you only have three months to live or you only have six months to live. That's not on the table. Um, it's, is this something that has no cure and is causing intolerable suffering, again, to the patient? So is this insufferable, toler uh, insufferable, intolerable suffering? Yeah, there we go. Okay, and not insufferable, tolerating. Um, intolerable suffering and uh, is irreversible. 
the CMA was involved, so our kind of national organization was involved in the Supreme Court, and they were involved as what's called a friend of the court, so basically someone who's not necessarily taking sides, but providing information, and that's what they had all of those meetings with other physicians leading up to it for. They presented both views in there, so if you read, and I know no one will probably read this, but if you, if you go through what the CMA actually said, um, and I believe it was Chris Simpson, the former CMA president, who kind of went to court and had a statement, um, he presents both sides, so he, because physicians had seemed to present both sides, so he presented both sides. Uh, some people argue that when you read through the way he presents it, he seemed to be a bit biased, more in favor of physician-assisted dying, uh, but that's kind of subject to interpretation, and you'd have to read it yourself to see what you think about that. Um, and, but he brought up some very important points, which I think all physicians would uh, appreciate. He said, we need better palliative care, we need safeguards to make sure and we need to protect our physician. So if a physician doesn't want to do this or there's maybe uh, something complicated, we need some way to protect our physician group. So he was really there trying to advocate for the physicians, um, it seems like. I'll take a few minutes um, just to go through a few of the other perspectives of kind of key stakeholders in this and people who you may have heard say things either in the media or in different ways. Palliative care doctors, uh, for the most part, so the majority of them in multiple surveys say they do not want this to be part of their care. Okay, and there's multiple reasons that they've given. Um, they just released a statement, I think, about two weeks ago as well, basically reiterating this. Um, their, st their stats show about three quarters say they don't want it to be involved. They don't want to be involved, but a quarter are okay with it. And there's this other hospice palliative care group, uh, which is more multidisciplinary with uh, nurses and other allied health uh, groups, which say which doesn't directly um, give an opinion on it, but says let's talk about good hospice care instead. So the palliative care views, so there's a lot of reasons you can imagine, but some of the ones they specifically give are um, palliative care is already being associated as kind of the group that plays a big role in death. So when people call palliative care, and if you've had to do it in the eMERGE department, and I'll tell you definitely in hospital, when you call palliative care, there's a lot of families that say, that means you're giving up, oh my, you know, I don't want to talk to palliative care, I don't want to go there. And they're worried that if they get associated with assisted death, that's going to be even a stronger association. They'll have trouble reaching that large group of patients who wants pain and symptom management, but not necessarily assisted death. So that's one of the reasons they give, and, and there are others as well. James Downer, who I've referenced there at the bottom, if anyone ever reads Healthy Debate, it's a nice place to kind of see some different perspectives. He's a palliative and ICU doc in Toronto, so he does both. And he's one of the strongest proponents in favor of physician-assisted death or medical aid in dying. So he writes a lot about it, and he was in this article, if you decide to read it, he talks a lot about why he thinks it should be part of their, their practice. The religious perspective, so whether or not you prescribe to a religious belief, uh, your, many of your patients will. So it's nice to at least know where they might be coming from or what their beliefs might be. Um, or if you were to consult a chaplain or someone from a certain religious faith, not necessarily the hospital chaplain because they're um, often non-denominational or at least uh, present information that way. Um, but if you decide to say, you know, I'm gonna contact this outside physician to, or outside chaplain to help me, it's nice to have a bit of a perspective on where, where they are. And I think it's, it's not really surprising um, majority of the religions, or at least all of the religious groups that have publicly released statements are uh, against any form of medical aid in dying. And they cite that principle that going way back to Sue Rodriguez's case in 93, remember we said the Supreme Court, one of the reasons was the sanctity of life, that life in and of, of itself has value. Um, that's one of the overarching principles in most of the religious ethical beliefs. So they say, you know, sanctity of life is most important and living a few more days, even if there is some suffering uh, or pain involved, has value. Um, death is controlled by a supreme being and shouldn't be by um, a, a person. Uh, autonomy is important, so I think everyone, everyone appreciates that, but they say sanctity, sanctity of life is kind of one step above that. They worry about slippery slopes, so if we start with this group, what's to say a more vulnerable group, someone who feels dependent, some other reasons external to themselves um, that they won't be, uh, they won't feel coerced in this. Uh, physician's role should be healer. And the other uh, point that you might hear sometimes from time to time is um, some suffering might have benefit. So even though uh, generally uh, most of us training in a Western environment who are maybe a bit more secular in our clinical belief probably have issues with that. Many people who have a more spiritual or religious perspective on certain things will say, you know what, 
uh, that has some value. Political parties, so this was a, maybe a bit more relevant be, before the election, but I'll throw it in anyway. So conservatives, we don't care what Harper says anymore, but I guess when we did care, he said it was off the table. Um, but I, I bring this up because one of the biggest proponents was a conservative MP named Stephen uh, Fletcher, who actually uh, brought it up to the table several times. Uh, the Liberals have not formally said, as far as I'm aware, and someone can correct me if you've heard something recently, uh, what they're going to do about this, other than they've created a committee um, to look into creating legislation, but they publicly, back as far as a couple years before the legislation, had been in favour of it. The NDP generally seems to favour it, but doesn't say anything too clearly, and the Green Party uh, had a very clear statement before the or just after the ruling came out in February that uh, they were very happy with the ruling. Canadians must be free to decide what they want done with themselves. This is the CMA went around, spoke to lots of physicians, and these are some of the reasons that they published that physicians are, are saying they don't want to be involved or don't want this to be part of their personal practice. And this is predating the legislation, so maybe a slightly different context, but uh, these are some of the thoughts. So the trust that patients have in physicians. Patients come in generally for medical care. Physicians start being associated with medical aid and dying. Um, many physicians fear that it would affect that trust relationship. The role of the physician as a healer, which we heard some of the religious groups also uh, echo. The slippery slope argument, and that was, again, going way back to the Sue Rodriguez case in 93, that was one of their, their thoughts as well, um, that uh, will vulnerable, vulnerable populations uh, become pressured into doing this. So the, um, let's pick older adults, because I'm in geriatrics, the older adult who's dependent on their kids, who are working very hard to keep them safe and comfortable at home, and they don't, they want their kids to go and live their own lives, but uh, they don't want to be a burden on them anymore. They feel guilty about what's going on. And other people might argue that, well, if that's the way they feel, maybe that's a reasonable way for them to feel. And if we think this is um, a legal option or an ethical option, uh, then maybe that's not such a such a bad slippery slope. You can have your own thoughts about that. Um, economic purposes. So how many admitted patients in the eMERGE? Lots. Um, how many ALC patients in the hospital? How many palliative patients without a palliative bed? There's a lot of backlog. And if you, so on the medicine wards, and many of you have rotated through medicine among the trainees and others at other times, know that we have patients on the ward who are strictly comfort care who our goal is not doing anything active, but they're in an acute care hospital bed for many days, sometimes weeks, because we can't really predict. And we're just kind of waiting for them to pass away peacefully. And that's in line with everyone's wishes. If we can make that happen in half an hour instead of half a week, there's a lot of economic pressure to say, you know what, maybe it is better to um, have that on the table sooner than later. So these are some of the concerns that came up. The conscientious objection group. So what if I don't want to assist someone uh, with this? What if I don't even want to refer them because I feel that's playing a part uh, in the process? What if I'm not okay with that? Then what do we do? Um, that, that's some of the concern that comes up. What if your, in, your institution is one with res, religious beliefs and the main one we have in Canada is the Catholic Healthcare Alliance and they are against this? What do we do then? What if there is no LHSC and it's just um, a Catholic healthcare hospital in that city? Um, with no access to another hospital, then what do we do? I'm obviously not answering all these questions because I don't know the answers, but it's just meant to get some food for thought and maybe some discussion going. Uh, people make the argument that, well, it's legal, so we kind of have to do it. Um, I bring up the point that laws are not always ethical. We have animal research laws. You may or may not agree with whether or not they're ethical. Um, there's a lot of debate. There was conscription in the war in the past, uh, which was a legal requirement, and then there was obviously slavery, which was uh, legal quite a while back, but clearly not ethical. So just because it's legal doesn't mean you have to think it's an ethical um, obligation. Then the flip side, so reasons to support it, and there was a lot that uh, came out here too. So respect for autonomy being the biggest one. So your patient should make their own decisions and if this is what they want we should be able to respect that it should be part of the continuum of care so we provide care kind of we often shift to pain and symptom management and maybe this is should be part of that trajectory although i've mentioned before palliative care docs for the most part don't see eye to eye on that but many of them do so a quarter of them at least do think that that should be part of the continuum of care there's some suffering you can't treat 
And if we have regulations in place, and this has actually been shown looking at all those jurisdictions that we did before, um, save for that one comment I made about Belgium, and all the other jurisdictions, when they do formal studies and try to look back, um, it seems to be that the regulations in place seem to prevent this slippery slope. Um, people against physician aid in dying will say, well, that's because the people who are doing the regulating are very invested in the process itself. Um, and some of that might be true, but at the same time, there doesn't seem to be any huge alarm bells. How do you assess for competency, right? We have a hard enough time figuring out whether someone is okay to be on drug A, B, or C. How are we really going to know whether they're okay with um, wanting to end their life? So it's going to have to be a much more engaged and much more active conversation. And how do we know it's really voluntary, especially in Emerge, where you guys are? How do you know that this person who's been coming in multiple times, and yes, you've been seeing them multiple times, how do you know there's no outside coercion? How do you know there's no outside pressure? Is it going to be mandatory to be involved in some way? So if that includes referring, almost certainly it will be mandatory. So uh, almost certainly, and we don't have any laws in place yet, so I can't say for sure, but uh, most likely that what the laws will say in February, if any do come out, is that you either have to be involved directly or you have to refer them. So um, the next question comes up, especially for in the eMERGE department, you have someone come in, uh, they, won't, they express to you they want this done, uh, they want their life ended for, for a variety of reasons, you've met them multiple times, you know it's legitimate, you know it's not core, they're not being coerced. Maybe you're not personally making this part of your practice right now, but who do you send them to and how do you know? Are we going to have a list of docs who say, yes, I'm okay with this? Um, are, we gonna, are you going to know that the internist in the hospital or the palliative care doctor in the hospital is okay with it? Um, it's going to be uh, messy, especially in a place where there's a lot of turnover. How do we standardize across places? So how do we know what we're doing in London is the same as what's being done in Toronto and in Thunder Bay and in Vancouver? So that's going to be a big issue, and that's where we hope that our national organizations will come up with some formal guidelines and, and um, things for us to, to follow. And then the bigger issue is our lack of palliative care, perhaps. And this is, I think, one of the concerns a palliative care group has, is we don't have good palliative care outside of major urban centers. Um, is medical aid and dying going to be seen as an alternative? So instead of meeting, you know, having this long, potentially drawn out process with the same potential end goal, depending on how you look at it, is it easier quicker, maybe more comfortable to go this route. How are we going to be trained to do this? Are residents allowed? So if you as the eMERGE doc are comfortable with this as part of your practice uh, and you've maybe attended a CMA has said they're going to put, or I believe OME said they're going to have some sort of seminars with some guidance uh, on how to do this, are you going to let your residents be involved? Are they going to be required to be involved? Are you guys going to have to play a bit of a role even if it's watching? Um, and where do you feel or sit on, on that? And then how are we going to have an, we're, we're almost certainly going to have some sort of committee, but I highlighted before the issues with Belgium's committee. It's after the fact, and there's a lot of bias in who sits on that committee. So how do we try to get around that ourselves? And so I'll pause there, or I'll stop there, I guess. Um, coming back to Marcus and Nancy, we talked about earlier, and I'll actually take a sec. So, Mohammed, did you have a chance to tally how many yeses and noes? Yeah, okay, so just tally it up as we have a discussion and we'll see how many uh, among the group said yes, how many uh, said no. Whenever I'm learning about sort of human rights or ethical issues, I try to draw parallels to similar situations in the past. So for this, the obvious sanctity of life debate being abortion. Mm -hmm. And especially in the end when you're talking about challenges and problems and pros and cons, you can say the exact same thing for the abortion debate. So I'm wondering how, if you know numbers on how physicians felt at the time of legalization of abortion compared to now that it's been in practice for so long, um, even the idea of referring to someone or keep, keeping a list of people who will do it, well, I think that happens in so. the planned determination world. Um, so, can you so, so I'll mention a couple of things. So one, I don't know numbers of what maybe some people in the audience might who are, who are practicing. That was in the early 90s, around 93, when I think um, abortion was, is no longer illegal. So technically, it's in a kind of law-free zone right now. So there's no law saying it's okay to do abortion, but there's no law saying it's illegal. So that's 
kind of where it's at. And if there's no laws passed with this by February, that's where it will sit too. It's not illegal. Um, I do know that one of the fears kind of in my, so this is all based on my reading because I wasn't in clinical practice back then. I won't say how old I was, but I was young. Um, so uh, one of the fears was that physicians felt they would be compelled to perform abortion. And that was one of the big fears among the group that were against it for moral, ethical, or other reasons. Um, and that never happened, right? It never happened that a physician is required to perform an abortion because there were enough people. Uh, and I think that one of the big reasons is there were enough physicians who were okay with that as being part of their practice that it was easy enough to refer on. Uh, I'm wondering from the audience if anyone was in, in practice back then, was it a challenge referring people to, because that's a great question, finding the right person or finding people willing to perform abortion? Any comments from some of our more experienced, I won't say old, experienced uh, physicians in the group? Because I don't know the answer, to be honest with you. Um, and you're definitely right, there's some parallels. Uh, um, and, and that's, yeah. So I'll, I'll leave it at that unless someone has some other thoughts, related or unrelated. Sure. My name is Bill McCauley. I'm an emergency physician here, but I also work at the CPSO. Okay. So uh, I wanted to give a regulator's perspective because we are currently in a, in, in, in a time where we don't really have any legislation around this, functionally, uh, or guidance. And, so, and part of the reason for that was because of the federal election in the, in the fall. It took so long. Um, and so the uh, FEMRAC, which is the Federation of Medical Regulatory Authorities of Canada, which is basically not an oversight group, but an advocacy group for uh, regulators who obviously advocate for physicians, developed a position statement on, on, on this issue that was published in the spring. And it was developed essentially to, uh, to, to help regulators to develop policies and uh, guidance for physicians who might get involved in this in the absence of any legislation. We, we currently still don't have legislation. Quebec is way ahead of the curve, as, as Raz has already pointed out, and uh, their legislation will go into effect as a law as of December uh, 15th. Uh, no other jurisdiction in Canada has either provincial or uh, provincial legislation in place, but other regulatory uh, 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 jurisdictions uh, are putting things in place. So both Alberta and Saskatchewan have guidelines and policies in place for physicians, uh, Saskatchewan just as of last week. Uh, that essentially guide physicians uh, into to how they are expected to act uh, in the best interest of the patient. So the CMA is an advocacy organization for physicians, obviously. The regulators are there to advocate for, for, for patients. So if you're interested in, in reading about those, both of those uh, jurisdictions have those uh, guidelines available on their website. Ontario um, currently doesn't have a policy. Um, and we're sort of waiting uh, to, to see what happens from the, from the Liberal government's perspective. There is some suggestion that the Liberals are going to uh, approach the Supreme Court to ask for an extension uh, from the, gen uh, the February 6th deadline. Um, what we don't know is, number one, are they going to ask for the extension? And number two, if the extension is granted, how long that would be? Um, uh, so uh, Council of our, of our um, uh, college is meeting next week on, on Thursday and Friday, and uh, they'll be discussing this issue. We have a draft policy that's ready to go, and uh, essentially um, it'll be discussed next week, and if uh, the, the Liberal government does not ask for an extension, then it'll be uh, kind of rushed through. Anytime we have a policy go through, it has to go to consultation for membership, and that consultation period has to last 60 days. So uh, we've got very tight timelines from the 4th of December to the 6th of February. So it's gonna have to go out immediately and then come back to a special meeting of council. And essentially these policies and guidelines look very much like uh, what the, the, the things that were highlighted in the Supreme Court decision, which are uh, the patient has to make the decision on their own, there has to be a cooling off period. But, um, part of the problem is that there's no definitions in the legislation for some of the terms that they use in terms of um, in, intolerability. So what, what is intolerable? How do we define that? So there are a lot of uh, things that, that, that uh, need to be put in place to guide physicians for this uh, uh, issue coming up. And it's important, um, uh, important to guide physicians because patients look at physicians as being, um, as, as, uh, being authoritative on these issues and, and physicians are in a position of power. Um, uh, the most prolific serial killer in the history of the world is a person named Harold Shipman. And Dr. Harold Shipman was a general practitioner in the UK and, and through the 90s killed over 300 people uh, by, by injecting them with opiates. Uh, and so his intentions were potentially uh, more nefarious, 
but uh, the thought is that he actually um, approached his patients um, uh, and, and suggested that their suffering would be less um, if, if he was to help them to, to pass away. And so that's an example of, uh, of where physician assisted, assisted dying or medical aid in dying can get out of control if it's not properly regulated uh, because physicians hold a position of power. So I, I, I'm not sure that this is, is something that's gonna come into our clinical lives in any significant way. I can't, I can't see that emergency physicians are gonna be called upon to actually prescribe, um, but it's something that we'll be involved with talking to patients about. Uh, um, so anyway, there is some guidance from the regulators and it's out there and, and coming from the Ontario perspective. Thanks. Any other questions, comments, clarifications? Uh, in the middle. You, we withdraw care very frequently yep. and put patients on fentanyl and midazolam. One of your points was physicians are supposed to heal and not assist or you know, kill people, but that's essentially what you're doing when you're making a decision to you know, take someone off life support or not intubate them and send them to the ICU because they have an advanced whatever. So how do you rectify that? With yeah. So, so I'll clarify. So um, um, that's not what I say by any means. I, those were those were points that came up in CMA. So I just want to make sure we're clear. But uh, from an, um, the majority of uh, ethical perspectives, if that's the one I'm going to take, including religious perspectives, they make a very distinct difference between um, withholding care, which is different than potentially withdrawing care, which is different than actively playing a role in. Uh, ending someone's life. So this is, uh, and the difference is um, if someone's already on life support and clearly not benefiting and you're going to withdraw some artificial treatment that you're giving them, whether that's a ventilator, medications or whatever else, that's viewed differently as someone actively giving them something. And whether or not you agree that it's actively different is, is totally different, but many um, uh, ethical perspectives, including, you know, so we can say maybe the most, I don't want to say extreme, but the most one side view are the religious perspectives, right? So they, because it's usually s built on something that's kind of inherent and maybe relatively inflexible compared to some of the other perspectives people may have. And even the majority of them are uh, generally quite okay with withdrawing care and most certainly with withholding care uh, when it's felt to be either futile or not very helpful in the long term. So it's felt to be distinct. Um, I think it's a longer conversation to go through whether um, it actually is or not, and people have different views. I think many people in this audience may also agree that it's, they're distinct. Actively giving something or prescribing something is different than not doing something else. But I think, is, is that kind of what you were getting at there? You may or may not agree that they're distinct. And are you, if you're one of the trainees, then we have, are you one of the trainees? Do you mind? Yeah, okay, so we're, are you here for grand rounds that, or for a half day that we're doing for the next couple hours? Because we're going to talk about that in a bit more detail um, there. I'll, I'll, I'll pause it there for a sec because I saw a couple more hands and if we have time we'll come back to that because it's a long conversation, I think. Please. Does the Supreme Court look at competency as a legal definition? I mean, we determine, determine capacity. And I think in the emergency department we would all have difficulty really determining someone's capacity and I think the, the Supreme Court has determined its competency which is a legal definition. Right, so, so I, I, they don't go into detail on, in the actual ruling on what they mean by competency um, and how to define that. What, and they haven't gone into detail on a lot of the details uh, as, as Bill, I believe, uh, just said. They haven't gone into the details I think purposely because they want to let the uh, CPSO, the other regulators, and the, our organizations sort out those details. Um, Quebec is one of the provinces that has said it's a, a medical definition of capacity, um, and they want to use that as their definition. And I think what we hope is that there's not a ton of variability between different jurisdictions, but we don't really know where they'll end up. Um, they have not said explicitly what they mean by that. I saw a hand somewhere else. Do we get numbers there? How many yes, how many no? So we have 32 for yes and 13 for no. Okay, so the question was, should you as a physician be uh, involved either in referring or actively participating? And about two thirds said yes, you should, and about one third said no, you should not. So 
you can think of that different ways. Regardless, three months from now, we will all be involved in one way or another. And if one third of the people in here are not quite comfortable with that, you have to really think about what role you're going to play. Because the at least refer, because I, I think I made it clear that that was part of it, is almost certainly going to be mandated similar to abortion, where if you're not comfortable with performing an abortion, you have to refer them to someone in a timely fashion who is, if that's what they want. Um, so a third of the people in here um, have a few months to figure out where they're going to sit there. If you refer, caveat is that if no one provides the care, yep. then the care is not going to be given if no one's obligated to provide it. Same with like, taking morals out of it. That's why abortions are, are only available in Canada despite being legal at any point in pregnancy. They're only available around 22 weeks or less because no one will provide it, right? So it allows us to make that moral judgment yep. as physicians. And, and that's, so I don't know where it will sit. So there's, uh, you, some of you may know Rob Sibold, uh, one of the ethicists uh, here at LHSC. Um, he did a couple polls with uh, physicians and even after um, saying that, you know, suppose your uh, regulator has given you guidelines, suppose a hospital has given guidelines, would you be okay? And still, uh, I believe about 40%, 30 to 40% of physicians that he polled, and these were all, I believe, staff physicians, uh, said no, they would not want to be involved. So what that kind of gets at is we will hopefully have a large number of people who, have anon who will anonymously say they're involved. What we don't know is how are we going to find those people? Um, and I don't have the answer to that. And that's a kind of system-wide solution and, uh, that we all need to be a bit of a bit part of whether or not you want to be one of those people aside, you need to know how to find them if this is going to be mandated and maybe we'll, CPSO will provide some guidance on that as well or, or some of our organizations about how to have that sort of list available. Just to your point around Rob uh, being the emphasis for the hospital, he also is co-leading a group for the hospital, yep. uh, again trying to develop, I mean, maybe part of it, uh, to develop sort of guidelines and approach for the organization uh, in anticipation of February uh, and uh, a recognition as, as you've already commented that uh, uh, St. Joe's and therefore Parkwood will not be a part of this because they are a part of the Catholic Healthcare Alliance. So in, in, in London, we are going to need to figure out uh, how we not only manage what comes through our doors, but if someone's presenting or, or receiving care at the St. Joe's site, how are they going to find this, this service? at the LHSC site because St. Joe's will not be a part of it. You can imagine Parkwood has a large palliative care ward. If someone there wants physician assisted death and Parkwood does not provide it, do they get sent over to LHSC for their final hours through the eMERGE maybe, direct to a ward? Like it's going to be, yeah, we don't know.